Joy. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church. Let's all turn and wave and greet our online visitors this morning. Good morning, good morning, wherever you are, whoever you are with. We welcome you to this morning's service. My name is Heather Kistner. I am a um, board member here at Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church. And on behalf of the board and our incredibly strong program council, we all welcome you this morning. If you would like more information on uh, TBUUC, we do encourage you to fill out those little white pieces of paper that you might find in front of you, hopefully. Um, or flag me after. I'll be sticking around and would love the opportunity to answer any questions that you may have about our community here. As you enter this sanctuary, you did pass a uh, youth religious education table. Miriam Davis is here this morning. Um, we have an incredible RE program. If you have questions about the RE program and all of the exciting stuff that we have with our young ones, um, don't hesitate to, to ask and inquire with Miriam on how your family can be a part of that program. We have two um, announcements before um, I come back up and, and give a final couple of them. So I will welcome uh, Diane Fox up to give announcement on the auction. You guys are amazing. I mean, we, the auction committee, are so excited by what everybody has submitted into the auction. It's incredible. We have actually, last year we had 27 dinners, this year we have 38. <clears throat> last year we had, we had uh, 12 parties, performances, and events, and this time we have 22. Last time we had six services, this time we have 19. And even travel and lodging, we have 11 versus seven. So we have amazing, amazing offers and I, offerings, and we are so thankful that you put on your thinking caps and came up with all these wonderful ideas. And some of them are very different. You know, so people really did think through, well, what, what can I do? You know, what would be, easy enough for me to do. <clears throat> anyway, we are moved by it. <clears throat> Sorry. The auction dates um, are, to, to bid on these auction items are November 30th through December 2nd. Um, and on November 30th, it will open at six o'clock. That day is the day to bid on any fixed price items because they go most quickly. Right, so, so if you get on at six and you just click the catalog and, and click on fixed price items, you'll see everything that is fixed price that day. You know, you continue bid bidding later on other items. <clears throat> and it will, it will close at nine o'clock on the second. Um, we actually have an auction table if you have any questions, uh, but the thing that you need before you bid is a bidder number. If you have not bid before, you need a bidder number, and just, just email us at auction at tvuuc.org, and we will give you a bidder number. It's very simple. Anyway, we love you, and we thank you. All right, our second announcement, uh, Barbara Lamb would like to come up and speak about a very important event happening. Mm 
guilty. So a question for you. Is it too late to RSVP for the potluck happening this Thursday? No. no. It is not. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. There's a real simple email address, potluck at tvuuc.org. You can sign up that way. You can email me personally or call personally. So here's a question number two. What if you wake up Thursday morning and say, wish I had signed up for that potluck. Can you still come? Yes. yes. Can you come in your pajamas? Yes. <laughs> Should you stop by the store and get something for you to eat and something to share? Yes, please do that. So of all the days of the year, um, being in the loving arms of your TV UUC family on Thanksgiving Day is a terrific thing. We're open, please come and celebrate the beautiful day that it will be. Thank you, Diane and Barbara. This Sunday is um, a pretty incredible Sunday, um, I, f I feel. And um, as I have listened to a lot of conversations um, surrounding our guest speaker this morning, um, I find that it is quite the honor to have him return this morning to deliver um, us a sermon, uh, or his sermon, excuse me. Um, Reverend John Burens is gracing us with his presence this morning. Um, many of you have heard him speak before. Um, our church has had two UUA presidents, and Reverend John Burens is one of those two. Um, we definitely want to provide him a warm and loving welcome this morning. Um, we will be celebrating um, his, his gift uh, that he provides us all after the service. Uh, I hear that there's a cake um, in the fellowship hall and some treats. So um, please allow me to uh, just give a round of applause for him. I know that there will be more than just this one. So yes, that is, that is a wonderful thing this morning. Um, so as we move forward in our morning together, please silence your electronic devices. And thank you to each and every one of you for being here. Good morning. We have several guest section leaders coming from Knoxville Choral Society helping us out today back with the choirs Dan Buchanan and uh, my wife Amy Asbury, Beth Noel and Mindy Wise and um, this prelude that we'll be singing Locus Iste the text means this place was made by God it is a holy mystery beyond reproach
Today is a special occasion as we mark the 50th anniversary of the Reverend John Buren's ordination by this congregation, which means he was a much younger man when uh, he took those ordination vows. But at the heart of his vows was this idea of not being a minister of any one sect or any one denomination, but the idea of universal ministry in our opening words are grounded in that vision. They are by Keshav Chandra Sen, who was from Brahmo Samaj, a Hindu movement that was very much aligned with Unitarianism. And these words are arranged by John Hayne Holmes. Unto the church universal, which is the depository of all ancient wisdom and the school of all modern thought, which recognizes in all prophets a harmony in all scriptures a unity, and through all dispensations a continuity, which abjures all that separates and divides and always magnifies that which unifies and brings peace, which seeks truth and freedom, justice and love, and individual discipline and social duty, and which shall make all sects, classes, nations, and races one global beloved community. Unto this church and unto all its members, known and unknown, throughout all the world, we pledge the allegiance of our hands and our hearts and our minds. Come, let us worship together. Let's sing, rise and sing our chalice lighting song. Let's join together in our opening hymn, which is 349 in your gray hymnal. We gather together. <clears throat> It is good to be gathered this morning in all the ways that we gather, those of us who are here in person, those watching from elsewhere in our building or at home, welcome. I have a story to share today that's adapted from one by Isabel Paglia called The Box. Can anybody guess what might be featured in this story? There's a mystery inside of a box, yeah. Well, you're, you can come up and tell the story, right? <laughs> yeah, you are exactly right. It began with a box with a mystery inside of it. It is a box that just showed up one day in the middle of the forest. And it wasn't a huge box, it was, you know, about that size. But the interesting thing about it is that it had two holes poked in it and when the animals came close and looked at it, they saw some eyes. And they said, what in the world? Who brought this box here? And what is it doing here? And 
You know, I think there's somebody inside this box. Well then, as the animals crept closer, the box started to shake. And they said, whoa, well there is somebody in there. And what do you think the animals did? Ran away, let it out. You know, actually what they did, they wanted to be welcoming. And so they said, hey, welcome to the forest. And they said it really loud to make sure whoever was in the box really heard them. And they said, hey, come on out. It's really nice. The sun is shining. It's nice and warm. You don't have to stay cooped up in that dark old box. And the box stopped shaking. And then they heard something. And what they heard was this croaky, creaky voice, and it said, No! And the animals all took a step back. And they kind of wonder, like, why? Why doesn't whoever is in that box want to come out? And they started to make some guesses, and the bear said, Maybe the, the, uh, whoever's in there feels like they're really different and like they don't belong. And the hare said, maybe they were outside and they saw somebody who was really mean and scary and had really big claws and chased them so they were scared and they went inside the box. And all the different animals had different guesses and they were kind of along the same veins. Why would somebody not want to come out of that little box? And then the wise owl said, you know, if we don't know what happened to whoever's in that box, but if, if, if some of these things might be what happened, Maybe whoever's in that box is afraid of us. And so all the animals took a step back. And they started to think, well, what could help make whoever's in the box not be afraid of us if they're afraid of us right now? And they started to come up with some ideas. And finally, the squirrel said, oh, I know, I know. Let's, uh, let's put on a big celebration. Let's, let's entertain them so they know we're not scary. Maybe we could be like a circus. So they did that. So they got costumes on, and they did somersaults, and they dressed up like clowns, and there was so much noise and music and brightness. And what do you think happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. And the sun was sinking, and it was getting cold, and so the bear said, that's all right. We'll try again tomorrow. So the next day, the animals conferred again in the morning and said, what do you think we should do? They said, you know, if I'd been in a box for a whole day or more, who knows how long, I'd be getting kind of hungry, so maybe we could have like a welcome party. So they brought all the best goodies. What's something you like to eat at a party? Like cupcakes? They had some cupcakes. What do you like to eat at a party? Spinach dip, yeah. The, the bear was a very good cook and brought some spinach dip. What else do we like to eat at parties? Yeah. Chicken salad. There was some chicken salad. Hmm, there were no chickens in attendance, so maybe that was okay, yeah. Yes, Theo. Cake, they had some cake at that party. They had all the yummiest goodies. Cake, yeah all the yummiest goodies they could think of and they arranged them so that they could all be seen through the holes in the box and they had a nice party together and it was the most fun that any of the animals had ever had in the forest. But what happened? Nothing except it seemed like the eyes were a little closer. And the bear again said, that's okay. We don't need to rush it. We'll try again tomorrow. Now the next day was a really cloudy day and it was colder. Is it sometimes a little colder when it's cloudy? And the bear was a little worried that it might be cold, so the bear, early in the morning, snuck up towards the box and just lay down right beside it and kind of gave it a little cuddle. The squirrel thought because the, the, whoever was in the box hadn't eaten anything at the party, uh, might be hungry in there, so quietly pushed a couple of nuts in through the holes just in case. And the hare thought, well, it might be nice to have a nice view, so arrange some flowers on the outside. But then, what sometimes happens on a cloudy day? 
It rains. There was a big boom of thunder. Let's make some thunder. And then the rain started coming down. Let's make a little bit of rain. And the animals all got really worried because what happens to a box when it rains? It might fall apart. So they said, oh no, we got to do something to help out because this box is going to fall apart and whoever's in there is going to get soaked. And so very carefully they worked together and they placed the box on the bear's back and helped keep it steady and went to the bear's den and set it down where it was warm and cozy. And then something happened. The box began to shake and then the lid started to come up, and with a rustle of feathers, it opened up, and out came a parrot. And the parrot said, thank you so much for waiting for me. And the owl said, I don't know what happened to you, but it's OK that it took you a while. Maybe all that you needed to feel comfortable with opening up was some friendly folks around you. And so I invite us to think this morning about all the ways in which we as a community and in all the circles of community that we're part of, we practice care for one another in all the different ways that people need care and the ways that people have provided caring for us in community as well. And that is our story for this morning. And so now, any of our learners and leaders who are heading to our religious exploration spaces, we will sing them out with our recessional. Good morning. I was talking with our friend John Coffey a couple of weeks ago, and after he introduced himself as the Reverend John Coffey, we laughed and agreed it was only right that I should admit, admit that I'm actually the irreverent Carolyn Rogers. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I am the irreverent Carolyn Rogers, here with you today as part of the spiritual care team. It also includes Mike and David and Tina and John Montgomery and John Coffey, and Doug Cox, and now Mebby Jackson. She's taken the training to be part of our team. We welcome Mebby, and we thank you, Gordon, who has taken this opportunity to move on to many other commitments he has in areas of service to others. He'd really like to say he's retired. What a thought. <laughs> so the spiritual care team is available to you in many ways, and I have a sales pitch prepared, but I will leave it at this. We all deserve to be heard. On one of our second Sunday listening booths, the spiritual care team member who had a booth invited someone to sit down, and that person hesitated, said, I shouldn't, because someone with something really important to say might need it. We all deserve to be heard. Call us. We'll listen. So as part of the spiritual care team, uh, part of our service to members and friends, I also help coordinate volunteers who want to help provide meals and rides and visits. So even though the spiritual care team is a group of trained volunteers, trained in active listening, we're not the only volunteers who are active in providing a valuable presence to others in our community. First off, though, I would like to say it's a joy to have John Buren's here, and so many familiar faces from that era. I was recalling um, that a child dedication for my son in 1978. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> and there are stories a lot older than that in this room. Um, so it is with a mixture of sadness and joy that we report 
A new home has been found for Bobby and Beverly cat Clark's cat, Jack. It's sad because the Clarks will really miss Jack, but they had to give him up because they couldn't take care of him anymore. And it's a joy because Jack is now safe in his new home with Alice Woody. Be sure to sign her thank you card. This is just one of the joys of the work of all of you who volunteer. As uh, David Massey reports, finding a new home for a 10-year-old cat is no easy task. But it all worked out thanks to Alice's feline hospitality, Mary Rogie's sage cat care advice, David, David Massey's Facebook posts, and Bobby and Beverly driving Jack all the way from their home in Union County to Alice's home in South Knoxville, with Bobby taking the whole trip to keep Jack calmed down. It takes the village to rehome a cat. <laughs> and in the meantime, uh, we continue to send healing energy to Beverly and Bobby. Please keep Holly Cannon and family in your prayers as they continue to deal with the loss of another, intra, uh, another IVF. She says she is so grateful for, she says these words, I am so grateful for your support and comforting words. Truly the choir and TVUUC as a whole has been such a grounding presence in this painful time. We also send light to Alan Braswell, whose father's been diagnosed with cancer and is struggling. Alan, whose mother died just about a year ago, is, <clears throat> is so glad to be able to spend time with his dad. Both he and his father take comfort in the presence of the family cat, Toby, who is keeping vigil. So this past week, we've been recognizing Transgender Awareness Week which is set aside to help increase understanding about transgender people and issues that members of the community face. Transgender Awareness Week precedes Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is tomorrow, November 20th. It's an annual obser observance that honors the memory of trans people whose lives were lost in acts of tra anti-trans violence. So you are probably aware of the recent actions of the Proud Boys who left a threatening banner and hate stickers on the windows at the Knox Pride Center earlier this week. This act of hate was particularly poignant since the banner and stickers appeared Monday morning, November 13th, the first day of Transgender Awareness Week. I have the privilege of being one of the chairs of the Pride Interfaith Knox Coalition and we drafted a statement of support for Knox Pride, which you can find posted on the Members and Friends pa Facebook page. When I sent this to Knox Pride, when I sent this statement to Knox Pride Center, Story Van Ness, a powerful trans woman who's their program director for trans and non-binary support, immediately responded, thank you all for this and for being partners, allies, and friends. So be sure to sign the card of support for the work of this center that's making such a positive difference in the lives of so many of our LGBTQIA plus siblings. Also, Dick Trowbridge is having surgery on November 29th. Keep him in your thoughts. And this week, keep Carolyn Franks in your thoughts as she has her long-awaited hip replacement. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Reynolds shares this request. Cindy is his uh, wife. Cindy's stepfather, Colonel Ed Morrissey, passed on Tuesday, November the 7th. We would appreciate the church remembering us in the weeks ahead. Yes, Jim and Cindy, we're sending you light. And today, we're thinking of our faithful friend, John Montgomery. He is recovering from minor surgery uh, that he had on Friday and reports that everything went well. Speaking of his faithfulness, I saw him here Friday morning cleaning and preparing the building for today's service. Now his surgery was that afternoon. Even though he had not been allowed to eat since midnight the night before in preparation for surgery. So thank you, John. And many thanks to the members of the Knoxville Choral Society helping us as section leaders in our choir today. 
be sure to go to the fellowship hall and sign the multitude of cards, some of which we didn't even announce today, so do that. We all know dear people who are carrying the sadness of loss and uncertainty of the future, and uh, we honor your privacy, those of you online and here today. We honor your privacy and your pain alongside these we have shared today. Let us also rest in the comfort of sharing our time together. Please join as we sing to send light and love to all of these today. Our reading for the morning comes from the late Gordon McKeeman. Ministry is a quality of relationship between and among human beings that beckons forth hidden possibilities. Inviting people into deeper, more constant, more reverent relationship with the world and with one another. Carrying forward a long heritage of hope and liberation that has dignified and informed the human venture over many centuries. Being present to and with and for others in their terrors and torments, in their grief, misery, and pain. Knowing that those feelings are our feelings too, celebrating the triumphs of the human spirit, the miracles of birth and life, the wonders of devotion and sacrifice, witnessing to life-enhancing values, Speaking truth to power, speaking for human dignity and equity, for compassion and aspiration, believing in life, even in the presence of death. Struggling for human responsibility against principalities and structures that ignore humaneness and become instruments of death. It is all of these, and much, much more than all of them, present in the wordless, the unspoken, the ineffable. It is speaking and living the highest we know and living with the knowledge that it is never as deep or as wide or as high as we wish. Whenever there is a meeting that summons us to our better selves, wherever our lostness is found, our fragments are united, our wounds begin healing, our spines stiffen and our muscles grow strong for the task. There is ministry. And two other readings. First, from the Gospel of Luke. For unto whomsoever much is given, much shall be required. And to whom we have committed much, of that one they will ask the more. And from one of my early mentors in leadership, the late John Ertha, an African-American Unitarian Universalist educator. These words. Anyone can be a leader. Leadership is nothing more than having something left over after taking care of yourself to care for another and for serving that vision of community beloved community, which we try to tangibilitate right here. There end our readings. Now we're entering into a time of prayer. This Friday we had a wonderful opportunity to learn more about the transcendentalists through John Buren's book. And so this is a transcendentalist prayer God, help us to see prayer in all action. 
and the farmer kneeling in the field to weed it, and the rower kneeling into each stroke of the oar, and the parent kneeling to tie a child's shoelace, and the athlete kneeling on the sidelines during the anthem, and the first responder kneeling to tend to the wounds of those harmed in our, any war-torn land. Help us to align our thoughts and our words with our action. Help us to pray not only with our lips, but with our lives. Help us to tap into that wellspring of joy within us that our lives may be like a cup overflowing. Help us to pray not only in solitude, but in community. Help us to pray as we labor with our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Help us to discover our ministry. Let's enter into a time of silent worship together. Amen. You may remain seated for our second hymn, which is hymn 32 in the gray hymnal. Now thank we all our God. Good morning. My name is Claudia Presley. I'm the Director of Finance and Operations here at TVUUC. Today is a designated offering Sunday. What that means is that 100% of any contribution that you give today goes to our designated offering organization, which is the Food Ministry of Fish here at TVUUC. The ways that you can give are through the offering baskets that will be passed here, checks or cash. There's a giving kiosk out in the lobby. If you're watching online, you can go to your computer, your tablet, whatever. There should be a green button, bar, something like that. 
You can push that. It will take you to a secure site where you can give using a credit card or a debit card. You can also set up a reoccurring donation that way. The other way you can give in the sanctuary or online is through text giving. The number is 73256. Type in TV UUC and the amount that you would like to give. So it's very appropriate that this weekend, as we all look forward to possible celebrations, lots of food and all, that we remember those who don't necessarily have that. So Claire Meeks is going to come and talk a little bit about the fish ministry here at TVUUC. Good morning, um, as Claudia said, I'm Claire Meggs, and I'm coordinator of our fish team here at the church. Um, so for those of you all who don't know about fish, fish is a local organization that provides food for those in need right here in Knox County. TVUUC has been part of the fish organization for many years, so since the 1970s. Um, many TVUUC members over the years have been volunteers for FISH, and they have passed the torch on to a succession of volunteers who've continued the mission of feeding those in need. We have a great group of volunteers here at the church, but we're not alone. FISH is a community-wide endeavor, so we work with churches throughout Knox County to help with this huge ongoing service to those who are in desperate need of assistance. So that means we even have to work with <coughs> Baptists and Catholics. <coughs> so how are we different from the TVUUC's little pantry, which is very visible out in the parking lot. Um, they also provide food through our church. But basically, we serve different groups of people. So the little pantry mainly serves individuals who are able to get there by walking or driving up. You know, it's a barrier-free type of service where they don't have to sign any papers, they don't have to fill out any forms. They just walk up and get what they need out of the cabinet. Um, so fish delivers food to families where they live. So we get information from the families, their name, address, how many in their family, so we can choose the right bag size for that family. And we take the food to their home. So we differ the little pantry and us differ in that way. Also, the little pantry, you know, has a relatively small amount of food, but people can come there daily or however often they need to get the food. But fish supplies a three to four day uh, worth of food, you know, in several bags that we take to the family, and, you know, we hope it will uh, help to feed their whole house, their household of people. So we complement each other. Um, so we both have the same goals, to feed those who are in need. So basically, I give this same spiel every year about fish. So um, it's, I feel like it's a very worthy organization, but we do need money to purchase the food and the extras like soap and toilet paper that we give out. Those kind of things like dish soap, um, laundry detergent, pet food, those are not able to be purchased with food stamps. And so people who call in are often in great need of some of those types of items. Um, so we do need money to purchase those things, but we also need volunteers. Now our need is to help, to get volunteers to help unload the truck that comes from Second Harvest, 
to bring food to the West Knox Pantry that we're a member of. And this is happening on Tuesday, October, not October, November 28th. So if you're available then, we uh, you know, always could use extra help to help unload that truck at the pantry, which is located fairly near to, uh, to us on Wise Garber Drive. Um, and we need people to bag up the food at the pantry throughout the month of December. We also staff the fish phone line on the third Wednesday of every month where we get calls with requests for food. So if you're available on a routine or an as needed basis, we would love to uh, have you as a new volunteer. Mike or Claudia in the office can put you in touch with me if you're uh, interested. So we get back to money. There is much competition for your money, especially at this time of year. Hopefully the important work that FISH does in our community will continue to get the financial support that is needed from TVUUC. So we're very dependent on that. Most of us are blessed with more than adequate food, shelter, clothing, etc., as well as all the luxuries of modern life. But let's try to help our neighbors to uh, get some of those basic needs um, answered with our generous offerings today. So many thanks for your contributions of time um, for those of you who are volunteers and of your money. We sure appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 
On this Sunday before Thanksgiving, I must confess my heart is almost overflowing with gratitude. First to Chris for the gracious invitation to return here on this anniversary. To Jin and Bob Mashburn, who have been so wonderful in hosting me. To the people still alive and kicking here <laughs> after 50 years. And to all of you who carry forward the mission, the purpose of this open and non creedal approach to religious community. Above all, I'm filled with gratitude that I was so lucky as to be called as the leader of this congregation 50 years ago. Because it was even then a congregation that knew that it had a mission. Religion defying oppression. Siding with love. Supporting human rights joining with people across confessional lines to feed the hungry, to bring about beloved community. When I speak to others about this place, I say, I, I was just astonishingly given the grace to start with a congregation that knew its job so I could learn mine. I think about the congregation in the late 40s and early 50s helping to provide an interracial summer day camp at no small risk when schools were still segregated. Taking out a, an ad in the local paper, full page, when the Supreme Court ruled on school desegregation, say, yes, it should be done with all deliberate speed. Housing and feeding the poor people's march that Dr. King had inspired. During my time, taking in, again with some trepidation, one of the first GLBT organizations in the community, only to have the windows shot out Your search committee uh, 50 years ago knew that finding someone to follow the Reverend Kenneth Torquil McLean, whose ministry preceded my own, would, was going to be, uh, the, Ken had made it a hard act to follow, let's put it that way. By the way, he's 96 now. Still sharp, engaged, and pastoral. Oh my God. You can't phone the man without him telling you about somebody else who's in the hospital. So they cast a rather wide net back then. They asked literally dozens of ministers to put on tape answers to a few pointed questions. And one of them was this. Is God, if any, within us or beyond us? And I answered, if anywhere among us. And then followed it by citing Martin Buber's I Thou and various Unitarian thinkers of the same vein. And when the committee told me that they wanted to present me to the congregation as their candidate, I almost broke into tears. I do that rather easily. <laughs> they later called me the weepy UUA president. <laughs> because that's a fit response to unmerited grace. Talk about being a community of faith. You put your faith in me when I was 25 years old. And you know why I accepted? Because although two other UU search committees had also asked me to be their candidate, those congregations were smaller, 
more unsure and more fragile, and I figured this one might last even when I screwed up. <laughs> and boy, did I. Every time Bill Keenan or Leroy Graff or one of the other elders of the congregation, usually department heads at the university, <laughs> invited me to lunch at the faculty club, I knew that I was being, as the Quakers put it, eldered. <laughs> because it's often said that it's not ordination that makes a real minister. It's doing several tough funerals. And I did quite a few here. The first I remember was for Jeff Jefferson, an African-American elder that I'd met only once in the hospital just before he died. And the funeral wasn't at the church, but at a funeral home in East Knoxville. And I brought to the occasion my collection of rather stoic, rational readings about facing death that I'd assembled during my apprenticeship in, among white New Englanders. This was not the occasion when a black woman stood up and muttered, preacher, push off from shore. <laughs> that came later when I was a guest in a black pulpit here. But it could have been, because the folks in the funeral home just looked at one another. And as we left for the cemetery in the interment, I grabbed Jeff's 20-year-old nephew, who had been introduced me, to me as a great singer. And I said, at the graveside, you sing the spirituals and I'll recite the psalms. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. And after that, I began, during my ministry here, to begin every single day by reading scripture. guided by the lectionary in my wife's Episcopalian tradition, because even when I hated what I read, I was reminding myself that to be a religious leader here in the Bible Belt, without a progressive, liberating interpretation of the same, we go out to face the Goliath of fundamentalism and reactive religion as almost illiterate and it ill behooves us who claim to be more sophisticated. And then came one terrible winter week when this young minister dealt with three suicides of young people all roughly my own age. First was Charles Michael, who was not only young, gifted, and black, but probably also gay or at least conflicted. He'd graduated from Howard in music and theater. He'd given a piano recital at Town Hall in New York. He'd started in TV in New York, but then somehow lost a job and feared being outed and took his own life. And then there was a young woman, not from a member family, but by then, I was sort of the chaplain to the local psychologist. And she was one of their mistakes. And she, too, took her own life. And finally, there was the brilliant son of our own Bill and Ruth Martin, who died in an LSD flashback, almost like a monk in Vietnam. And I will never forget how, before the memorial service for Charles, I had to send my dear wife, Gwen, who is also clergy, to minister to Ruth, while Wade Till, that mensch <laughs> who was a rock and a refuge for me, put his arm around me and said, well, I know one young preacher is going to earn his pay round here for a change. Wade, you know, was a white cousin of, a distant cousin of Emmett Till. 
and I sometimes spoke of him to my colleagues as my white Mississippi anti-racist golf ball salesman. <laughs> May he rest in peace and power. When I went out to do some inherently dangerous things, much in the, in the mode of the congregation, like help the ACLU with unannounced court-ordered inspections of the county jails, in this part of the state, I'd tell Gwen, now, if I don't get back this evening, call Wade. He'll know what to do. And on those, some of those visits, I found abuses, like inedible food catered by the sheriff's brother-in-law, or a teenage boy in a cell with real convicts with cigarette scars on his back and murmurs of having been raped. That was right here in Knox County, by the way. These things only deepen my conviction that liberal religion goes wrong when it begins to think that evil is just the absence of good. Or that human nature, while not inherently depraved as the Calvinists have it, is also fragile and capable of both self-forgetting and great good in the service of others and of outright evil. We see that in every war, like the one raging even now in Gaza. I also saw how Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams was quite right in encouraging every one of us, amid all of the evils that we see, to try to pick just one where we think we can make a difference and learn more about what's behind it commit ourselves to going to the best organization that is countering it and do what we can to ameliorate. Preferably using a notion that stems from, as we all do, stems from the radical wing of the Reformation that says that the church is no mere vessel for ritual and nostalgia. It is a priesthood and a prophethood of all believers constantly reading the signs of the times for what needs to be done, and then creating those voluntary associations across sectarian lines for ministries of both warning and of healing. Yeah. I hope you know that virtually every important, powerful, voluntary association in this state from the ACLU to Planned Parenthood to the Sierra Club, got its start among Unitarian Universalists. When I was here, the church cooperated with the Sierra Club, whose president was a member, in the very first celebrations of Earth Day. We opened the first recycling place before local government did much in the old parking lot. We even joined in a joint statewide advocacy for a bottle bill. I hear you still haven't passed it. <laughs> that is container deposit legislation. And I ended up appropriately feeling a bit naive. I hadn't known that the Speaker of the House, who went on to be governor, was also the largest beer distributor in the state, and the bill was dead on arrival. Likewise, when Judy Ann Langston persuaded me to try to help those who were being deinstitutionalized from what was then Eastern State Psychiatric Hospital, I found myself the 29-year-old president of Group Homes Incorporated until it became clear that the Tennessee Department of Mental Health had absolutely no intention of letting ordinary citizens like us see what they were doing and not doing how they were more interested in cutting costs and saving their own bureaucratic jobs than in helping the people with long-term mental illness. And they pulled their essential support. These are the stories behind the homelessness crisis across our whole country, by the way. But as my late friend, the w Reverend William Sloan Coffin would put it to those of us who worked against the war in Vietnam in my generation, if you find yourself becoming disillusioned, 
Stop and ask yourself for a moment why you entertained so many illusions to begin with. <laughs> and then get back to the struggle. Or as Howard Zinn once put it, to be hopeful and persistent in bad times is not just foolishly romantic, it's based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, of sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will de determine how we live. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do what needs to be done. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently, it gives us the energy to act, and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act, in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents. And to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory." Unquote. So I would remind you that Chris and I are not the only ministers here today. We heard that in the reading. We're just the sorry schmucks who decided to serve and become financially dependent on you. <laughs> <laughs> to help and encourage you to serve in the rightly called prophethood and priesthood of all the faithful. That's you, and you, and you, and you, all of us. It's those who died in this very room protecting children, grounded in gratitude for the gift of being, the gift of being here together called into beloved community, shaped and encouraged and made wiser by the process through the years, giving us a reason to praise and worship and pray together week after week to embrace life even in the face of death, to be made stronger in our faith and devotion to the loving transformation of evil into good. That's our job. At my ordination 50 years ago, I felt so unworthy of the call that was being placed upon me, both to the ministry of this congregation in that time and place and to the service of the Church Universal, that I asked dear Karen Yarborough, who was then the music director, if she could have the choir sing a Brahms setting of Psalm 51. Create in me, O Lord, a clean heart and a right spirit within me. David Asbury so beautifully asked me to what I wanted for music in this service. I said I'd like that prayer for all of us because I think it'll help all of us discern our own ministries in fulfilling the collective dream of beloved community. And Chris picked up on what I had in mind and reintroduced it to the liturgy, something I learned here during my last visit. Reach out your hand. If your cup be empty, if your cup is full, may it be again. Let it be known there is a fountain that was not made by the hands of men. In time, of course, we'll all be among the dead. 
I just pray to be among the grateful dead. <laughs> With something still left over after having taken care of my own life to care for a few other lives, to have given what I could toward the building of beloved community that will last even after I'm gone. That, my friends, is a mission that I invite you to renew here, because even here and now, it is forever waiting to be fulfilled first in part, just here among us, and then out there in the world around us. So may your different ministries, like my own, in the end leave you feeling blessed and fulfilled and grateful. And in the final Thanksgiving, grateful for all the learning and the serving and the living. Amen. that prayer and our thoughts and minds, I invite you to rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn, 298 in the great hymnal, Wake Now My Senses.
And now, in our going, may love shine upon us and guide us on our way, but may it also shine out from within us. Mark our every human interaction, our every effort, no matter how small, to convert love into its social form, which is justice. May the day be hastened by us when we can say together with all the Earth's people, we are one. We are one. We are one. We invite you to join us for a special reception in honor of John Buren's, but at this moment, I invite you in our last act of worship to turn and greet your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> 